I've created this saddle shape to help explain some things about the curvature filtering in Bryce. It has a couple of creases here and otherwise a smooth transition in, in the saddle just here. The, the reason for this being it creates an area here that the, the surface is quite ambiguous and this will show up some of the shortcomings or, or if you want features in the way that curvature works. To begin with though we're going to have to set something up in the material so I'm going to go into the material editor and put a blob in this channel here and I'm going to go hold shift click on the name navigate to basic and select this check blue uh, the reason for selecting this is because I'm familiar with the way this texture is set up so there are no horrible surprises in there and I'm going to go into the texture source editor and click on these blobs so we can get through the channels active and modify this filter to curvature we'll just leave it like that for now and check out of here modify this view to actual selection so we can see our saddle check to make sure that engaging curvature in the texture has automatically switched on the curvature um, feature in the material so if that's not checked then you can have the curvature filter and it won't do anything so just be aware of that because sometimes it just turns itself off at random I don't know why uh, I think it might be something to do with some of the textures um, interfering anyway there you go you can see now we have curvature and it's not really that clear what's going on here this is one of the problems with curvature is it's difficult to set things up so you understand what's going off so I'm going to modify this material now I'm going to change this channel to a pure red color this channel to a pure green and this channel to just blue and I'm going to check we've got linear and turpol 3 and then go to the noise and turn it to nothing make sure we've got no phase active either that's good and so here we have the curvature filter and it's not in its default state so we'll set it in its default state to start with check out of here I'll just double check that we are calculating curvature and switch and now you can see or rather you can, can't see that it's not doing very much as things stand maybe you can make out a slight change in the color here towards green now what we have in the material in the deep texture editor is this filter you can increase uh, the what this this a value and what that does is it narrows the transition so this blue area that's that's curved the green area is a transition between curved and flat and red is flat they the point at which all the measuring takes place is along this right hand edge when you're just measuring curvature alone when it comes to measuring the difference between concave and convex uh, it moves to the middle but when it's just curvature you need this transitional area to be close to the right hand side or you need to sh shove it across using this so you can move that backwards and forwards uh, and this narrows the transition between what it considers curved and not curved so I'll just reset that again and just we'll just crank it right up to this edge and I'll show you the effect of that so we check out of here you can see it's actually working in the preview there and check out of here and now what we have is these areas where the crease are are deemed curved this area is in a transition but is a little bit curved here and these areas are considered flat now there are two key things to bear in mind when using curvature filtering on your meshes one that the mesh resolution is significant so because this is fairly low resolution mesh what you see are these artifacts so these are the facets of the mesh and the curvature doesn't do uh, like when you smooth shade something it hides the transitions of the lighting over the mesh curvature doesn't do that so these facets uh, the curvature is measured relative to their neighbors at some distance we don't know but that that is clear when I show you what happens when we scale things and as a result you see these facets and it's it can be a problem because it shows up in your renders and can create some ugly effects uh, however uh, oh, oh, as an aside if you bring in your mesh as something other than an OBJ format uh, OBJ's 
have smoothing data, but if it doesn't, it might come in unsmoothed, in which case, even though you've engaged curvature, all you're seeing is little weird artifacts over the surface, and that's because curvature is trying to detect the curvature at the edges uh, where the facets join, and uh, it, it, on this scale you won't see very much effect of that, it'll just look like it's broken. So if that's the case, and it turns out that your mesh isn't massive, if it isn't massive resolution then the smoothing process can take a long time but if it isn't then you can just smooth it and that will let Bryce uh, calculate some smoothing data which it then uses for the, the Gerard shading when, it, when it's lighting it which is how you don't see the facets even on fairly low resolution meshes. Aside, aside. Right, okay, back on topic. The other thing to consider is the scale at which the object is in Bryce. Some measuring has to take place for, for curvature to work. It's got to know what the geometry around any one point is doing for, 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 for to determine if that area is curved. Unlike any other filtering, the curvature filtering is highly dependent on its neighboring geometry. So, if we make this object much smaller and zoom in, what you will find is what's deemed curved uh, is, has gone up. We're detecting more curved area. And, and, and the reason for this, I, I think, anyway, is because we're now measuring a greater distance. So before it was just measuring a short distance, so this area didn't look very curved. But if it's now measuring this far, for example, then it's seeing a, a greater transition in which case it's saying oh we're in a curved area because this area is pointing in a completely different direction likewise we go back control z control z and then enlarge this object what you find I have to widen the field of view now is it's looking less curved because the, this piece of geometry is only looking to a short distance away because the object's much larger and as a result everything around it seems a lot flatter. Control Z, Control Z. I suppose it's like as if you were stood on a hill and you were just looking at the ground under your feet. The area would seem fairly flat. Whereas if you looked into the neighboring valley, you would say, oh, it's all quite crinkly. And and then the, nothing's changed. It's, it's neither, neither more or less crinkly. It's a purely your perspective based on scale. You can compensate uh, to some extent uh, by uh, modifying, no, not that one, by modifying this curvature filter uh, because you can change the transition. So if we, if, if, we, if we were to do this, for example, it should be possible. Now, now we're getting a, 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 a more gentle transition. So, so things are not looking as curved to the curvature filter at this scale. It should be possible by making this smaller because it then becomes more sensitive that it will change its behavior and start to look a bit like it did before, but it's not the, quite the same. So this was what makes uh, curvature filtering quite a tricky thing to handle because of this uh, variation in, in difference in scale. I should point out on the features, I'll probably come back to this later, that uh, if I just control Z to back work to where we were, yes, okay. So if we modify this so we squash it so it goes flat or nearly flat, if it goes completely flat then things could get a bit wonky. You'll see that it's still measuring the curvature even though it's getting progressively flat. I think as long as we give it a little bit of Y value scale, it won't break anything. I think if, if, if you make it perfectly flat, which yes it's zero now then you might see some artifacting uh, it's not occurred here but I have seen it before now the reason it's still giving us a curvature response is because it's measuring the curvature on the basis of the default scale in which the mesh was brought in so because it was brought in as, as, a, as, a, as a saddle shape it's still aware of that and then the scaling as far as Bryce concerns takes place after the curvature filtering has been done. However, you can make it take account of your scaling by engaging this world space curvature. So now it will see it as flat because it's applying the scaling and then doing the test of curvature, which means that if we give it a bit of altitude by scaling it up, then it will respond 
progressively. So there's just that feature to bear in mind because it, it's not, not always immediately obvious that that's how things work. So I'll just check that that's turned off and we shall move on to finding concave. So now I've engaged finding concave you can see that there's, there's nothing really happening anymore and I touched upon this before the reason for that is the the area at which it's uh, detecting the difference between concave and convex is in the middle here so we, if we move this transition zone to about the middle eyeballing that to be about there then we should now be in a position to see the difference between concave and convex and you can see the artifacting issue is greater here now, you can modify the way in which it treats areas where it's a bit ambiguous. And by ambiguous, if you think about this shape. If you're in the saddle, front and back, you're in a concave area. Whereas as far as your legs are concerned, going over the saddle, you're on a convex area. So in this sort of region, it's not entirely clear whether we're in concave or convex and we're detecting the difference between concave and convex so where this transition takes place so suddenly you might find that it's changed its mind over which condition we're working under so to this end there is a switch here called hard edges and that modifies the way it treats these transitional areas and it will deem them either curve or not curve so you can see now that these are concave areas and this whole area here is now deemed concave and it suddenly transitions to convex just here in a way that creates something of a <coughs> an ugly artifact now we can do something to uh, to battle that inside our texture editor here so if we think about this green area being the transition but instead we're going to look at the alpha channel rather than the colors because I want to use two components and it's going to get difficult to use two components to to do this so I'm going to have to set this kind of output up but taking it from the alpha which is fine we can do it here so if we, we turn off our color here and engage a color here with linear interpol 3 and I'll just turn this to green so it matches what we've seen before we can now interpret alpha output as a color output just turn bump off we don't need that so I'm going to take this component and move it over to the second component select average and then I can use this control which allows us to move this transitional point back to the left and then move this one to the right and what this allows us to do is to create an output where the transition is more of a plateau and if we can do this just right by widening that plateau we can we can reduce the area of ambiguity so we're still getting too much convex here but we've got rid of the concave issue so that means I need to push this blue area back so if I drag this number down it'll move this transition over to the left a bit and you should get in a position where we've got a better balance but we can still detect the difference between concave and convex uh, there's a little bit of an artifact here and here and I don't really know how I can get rid of that it's obviously some ambiguity again over whether we're in in a convex or concave territory because it is curving in at this point at the same time it's curving over here but as we get into this edge there's less curve over so it's, it's responding to the to the curve in there so having created this and we're now using the alpha output it allows us to consider how we might uh, filter a texture purposefully to, to create some kind of effect so We'll just look at the alpha output here. I'll turn this uh, off so we can see we've got alpha. And if we hold the, is it shift key down? Click on that, no, it's control key, I always forget. Control key and click on this blob, it allows us to engage to additional channels that are filtered according to the alpha output of this third channel. Now I'm just gonna put in, uh, let's see how, put in, something simple I will put in this this check blue again and again and I'm going to modify this one I've got to get this right first time and to modify this channel just to red take this to a sign look at the alpha output turn off that 
and I want the sign to be giving us a fully black alpha output with a color of red and so with that full red and black alpha output we can then go to say that that's to remind me that when this alpha output is black it's giving us this first channel which also corresponded to the way that the outputs were arranged here so where it was concave and now if we modify this channel in, in a similar way so I'm going to get rid of the, the the noise function there take the sign and put a sign output in and take it up so we get a full alpha white and it's already giving us blue so that's convenient so when we're fully blue it's white so this was where it was convex and that's been selected by the alpha white and now we're not giving any color output from this channel you can see that we've got a similar arrangement this is the what was green which is a transition so that's a mix between this channel and this channel so that's a mix between those those two outputs so you can see now how this relates to building a material that you could use on something purposefully because then you can assign different textures to these components although I've just assigned raw colors in this case so having set this up we looked at that we're not going to talk about curvature count for bump the things get really strange when when we start using this and that's going to have to wait for another video when 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 I understand it, I still don't understand it so th that that's to come hopefully back on topic okay right so what we're going to do with this is we're going to apply it to a terrain and then look at the way it affects the, the terrain so I'm going to create a terrain in the background there select the saddle select the train go into the material check out of there and what that's done is because I selected the saddle first that's transferred the material that I had on the saddle onto the train so I can delete that and I'm going to enlarge well no we won't enlarge the train first we'll just have a quick look at it at this scale so you can see it's looking a bit noisy and so what I'm going to do is modify that terrain edit it and use eroded and what that will do is smooth the surface out a bit and create some obvious features for us to to work with on in terms of curvature and now if I have a look at that you can see it's still looking quite noisy so bear in mind what I said about the scale of the object so we're going to scale this object up and you can see a simple the features but it's still not at an appropriate scale for what I want to do so if I'll pull the camber back and then scale it up again you can see now more of these purple areas are appearing that's that's our transition zone so pull the camera back mm -mm -mm -mm. okay and then scale it up some more and now oh, okay so is they're looking a bit too narrow those features so scale down again so th there was there'd be two ways of doing this we could just modify the scale as I am doing which is a bit of a lazy way of doing it I suppose or we could go in and modify the filter but since we've gone to the trouble of setting this filter up already and I've shown you how to modify it we might as well just scale the terrain to the point where I think it's going to be helpful for us to try something out so the same rule applies with the world space curvature so we can use that to change the response make it more or less subtle uh, when we modify the height of the terrain which can be useful or it can just be uh, another another variable to cause confusion so I'll go back in there and turn that off for now so I said red was uh, concave areas and blue was convex areas and this was how this was being selected here and we can move these around to change this transition zone but that's quite a fiddly thing to do as you've seen so it's probably easier at this point to change the scale of the train and make everything else fit that where things get a little more complex is when you're considering bringing terrains in, in to interact with atmospheric effects because at the moment I'm only I'm, I'm using no atmosphere in the render when you're wanting the terrain to work with the haze then the scale of the terrain is to some extent set by the the atmospherics and the way they work in Bryce and at that point then you have to set your terrain up and then modify your curvature filtering to suit the size of the train in this case we have the luxury of setting the train up so it's fitting the curvature filtering that saves us quite a bit of time so what I would 
conclude with, since this has gone quite a bit, is now if we know that the red is concave and the blue is convex, then we could load in some textures here. Let's let's use something, I don't know, rocks. So concave, I uh, quite like this, grid rock. Um, and what I'll do is I'll make that a bit darker in parts. So we'll just darken that quickly. And on the convex one, we'll use something uh, lighter like this rocky planet. So what that's doing is um, we're going to see this dark, gritty material on, on the inside and mixed in with transitional areas. So let's check our scaling here. Let's bring that up a bit, maybe about 20. That's usually about the scale I work out with these things, but maybe a bit less. OK, let's, we'll just try something. I don't know whether it's going to work. So my idea is that the l outer edges of the are going to be like a, a whiter rock so where it's I don't know been weathered or exposed and the inner surfaces are darker where potentially there's less light getting so it's, it's providing a bit of a sort of a, a, a substitute for ambient occlusion and oh we want some bump Let's stick some bump in there hold control key down click on the third blob and put in our 20 bump to start with check out of there and give that a render so it's it's doing our filtering you can see we've got the transition between light and dark so I've made that quite dramatic. It would probably be better to make it maybe a bit less um, extreme than that. And I'm just moving the the light around to an angle so we can we can look at the the bump effect as well. So I think we'll just go for it with the bump, turn it right up to something, and I'll move the camera in, and we'll just have a look at the surface that we've produced now. So as things stand, uh, that's working pretty well I can't see much evidence of the grid rock in there but that could be a scaling issue so to check that I'll show you what I do is I store hold the control key down the the setting because if, if they if they become deselected then and they've got no other blobs in there then Bryce just removes those channels for you so if I store those three in the specular setting I can look at the the, the grid rock on its own and see what that looks like on its own a bit noisy and a bit dark I probably shouldn't have gone so dark on that so I can just reload that uh, from there for example and then have a look at it I wanted to see some real gritty effect there um, sometimes the textures can work better with the legacy bump the, it all depends on the direction the light's coming from. It could just change the whether it looks like it's inside out or not. I'm going to modify the material and lower the frequency of that somewhat because we're, we're dealing with a fairly small terrain. So there we go. And that is it's quite a dark material anyway. I may not need to needed to have darkened it. I got a bit carried away there, so I'll pop those back in. And we'll have a look how that looks now. I've done a few modifications. So. I was probably right to darken it a bit. Yeah, okay. So uh, I'll darken that. I can do it this way with HLS and just bring that down. I'll just not go so far as I did last time. There we go. And there, and there, and there. And uh, so th what I find with curvature is that probably still this is a bit too extreme on this uh, a transition between light and dark. You want things to be to match up to some extent and then just to, to expose some details otherwise because you don't want to you don't want it to be dominated by the curvature because then it looks a little bit unnatural but uh, there is a, a, a rather long-winded video about curvature filtering which will hopefully allow you to investigate it yourself by setting up the curvature filtering and begin to build your own materials using a, a curvature filter that selects between different textures that you've pulled out of the library or made yourself bear in mind you could just as well have put textures in that also are filtering curvature in different ways so in that case you can get more of a sophisticated interaction between you know, like have a, a, an overall selection of curvature and then a localized selection of curvature so a selection of curvature within the curved areas by moving the transition and a selection of curvature on the exposed areas you can have different responses that way which creates more interesting materials. So there you go, that's the end of the video. I hope you found that interesting and instructive and it will allow you to go on and make your own curvature materials. Cheers now.